Mm. Yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks uh, again for coming. Uh, we'll, we'll get started. We're going to start off this morning in, or in just a second after intro remarks, in Romans 1, starting verse 18. So everybody kind of wants to start there. <clears throat> um, today, let's see. Well, let's start with our memory verse. I'm going to turn off the rough job at this time. All right, so. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, these who have turned the world upside down and come here to you. All right, so today we're going to be talking about the, the allure of the mystical, ir irreligion, Satanism, hedonism, and the cult of you. So that's a mouthful. And just to make sure we define terms as far as what we're talking about, because I kind of lump all these together so this is if you disagree with me on this is very much my kind of putting a lot of this together so make sure and bring that out but um before we jump into um, a lot of that uh the two highlighted sections right here those are especially key i i would submit to you for today um just as far as identifying why we can sometimes get sucked into these things um and then also discussing that that each of us used to employ um you know, how to take our hearts from these things, how do we protect our children, all those other things, and just mostly inwardly focused today, I would, I would say, too. Okay? and then also all of us, you know, raising children or who have raised, make sure and bring those comments to point, um, and, and if you disagree with anything, absolutely, like, like bring it up, let's talk about it. Um, so again, we're going to be talking heavily, uh, not into necessarily doctrine today, next, next week we're going to be getting into the first of two lessons on the Jehovah's Witnesses belief, uh, that structure is going to be, I should have covered this on the calendar, that structure is going to be, um, the first lesson will be mainly what they believe. Um, and again, the idea that you can cover one denomination or whatever you want to call it in, in one class is, is not true. Like, So we'll try to get the essence of what they believe. And the second class will be how can we talk to someone in that faith and try to bring them to Christ or protect ourselves and have a conversation with that. So because I'm sure... All of us will have those types of conversations. So we're going to be dealing with opinions today, too. So same thing as we said last week, always, you know, it matters outside of doctrine, how we rightly divide. All of us are on different different uh, understandings a lot of times with, well, not understandings, but our path of, of gaining wisdom, knowledge, and rightly dividing scripture. So we'll, like, let's make sure and treat everyone with respect. We can we can have disagreements in non-doctrinal things. And even with doctrine, we want to always have the mentality of helping each other get to heaven and, and rightly dividing together. So it's a long-winded way of getting, getting where we're at. So I just like starting off like that with this class specifically. So uh, the cult of view is kind of what I'm categorizing this entire segment together. So I lump a lot of this stuff together, which, again, tell me if I'm crazy or not. So your religion, and, and forgive me for just reading off the slides, like you know, presenting one-on-one, but just bear with me. So irreligion, indifference or hostility to religion, a lack of religious belief. So I think that that categorizes much of secular society that we, we all live in today. Satanism, uh, a myst mystic system of belief based on personal freedom that has Satan as the central figure. So I don't know about y'all, whenever, like when I first kind of stumbled upon this and doing this research, I didn't think Satanism would be involved in this. I've always thought of Satanism like a cult, funny enough, we're talking about cults, but like, you know, robes, meeting in the woods, like sacrificing something, you get arrested from belief, like, you know, pen, well, not the Pentagon, the little structure, Pentagram, there we go, yeah. I have a limited vocabulary, all right, so it's good. Um, no, it's fine, I, I encourage that. Um, no, that, that's why, but it actually goes a lot, a lot deeper than that. that that's kind of a, almost a, a uh, very shallow view of, of kind of that that belief system, but then also hedonism, uh, the doctrine that has pleasure and happiness, um, is a soul or chief good in life, and that that is very, like there are individuals actually calling for hedonism. Like hedonism is the only answer. There's only we'll say this is the only logical answer. I, I read a guy's blog that he's a, a financial uh, influencer, I guess you want to call him, um, but his piece wrote an article like hedonism is the only logical way. Where it's like your self, self uh, development, your self uh, pleasure is the only logical solution in life. And without God, that that would make logical sense. But as soon as you realize that there is a God, and that's kind of when that that falls apart. Um, sorry, let me get caught up with that. 
So this, I, I got a couple of, of articles here. I'm, I'm a big news guy, so I took screenshots. And, and this, this is from October 2022, so this is a little older. Um, but satanic cults aren't as bad as they sound, which is kind of a shocking headline, right? Clickbait almost, get drawn in. But the little underlined red section here is where um, I, I kind of want to draw your point to is uh, says, in truth, modern day Satanists are not violent activists who treat Satan not as the embodiment of evil, but of, but a symbol of resistance against an arbitrary authority. So just kind of different segments here. Maybe not even saying that Satan himself exists, but that he he's a symbol of basically everything against Christianity. So, and look look at the kind of passive insult here, you know, against arbitrary authority, right? So against, you know, biblical authority, it's not real, it's arbitrary, it's as, you know, real as anything else. So it's it's a going against this. It's church for the anti-authority. Exactly, yeah. So, and then, and then two, so uh, the little third uh, bullet point, right? they're using their status as official religions, cults like the Temple of Satan run campaigns to protect LGBTQ and abortion rights. So them together, if they identify as a religion, there's a lot of governmental benefits that come with that. So it kind of likes to go that route too. So uh, kind of interesting, I thought. This is interesting. This is from uh, Sat this was yesterday. How about that? Um, I should remember that, right? Uh, the case for making Earth Day a religious holiday. It's from Tennessee. This is kind of out there too. And I, that's what I wanted to draw your attention is Roman 118. Um, just as, as not worshiping the creator, but looking at the creation and not seeing it for what it is and drawing the exactly wrong conclusion. So this is the argument for this whole article is we need to treat Earth Day as a religious holiday. And, and it's, it's a worship of Mother Earth, this type of thing. Could, would someone read that for me? Anybody have a turn here? No, I can't. Um, Romans 1, 18, uh, 1, 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clear, clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God nor were, were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and the birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. In verse 25, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. So I, I see this, and this is exactly what, what this verse means to me, or, or one of the one of the lessons from it, as worshiping the here and now, like looking straight past the forest and seeing a tree, you know, I guess pun intended with all earth day and all this other stuff. Um so again, if there's any thoughts, please. Um there's, not, there's nothing new about that. That's just guy repackaging. Package. That's a good point too, yeah. Because that's what the whole paganism is always yeah, it's been. It's always been. Right. Great intro. The return of paganism. <laughs> Unintended. Great. Um, I can bear with me. I, I really think there might be some value in, in reading this. So just it, so the return of paganism, the spiritual crisis afflicting contemporary America has ancient and enduring roots, and so does the cure. Um, starting up here with the, the red lines, um, with no dogma to uphold, the so job of deities was simply to be themselves. So saying that these gods didn't have something for us, they were just, they were just gods, they were just there. Um, and the more, I can't pronounce that word, solophistic, uh, a deity chose to be, that's the theory that only the self exists or can be proved to exist. I had to look that up. Uh, nothing at all radiates inimitably, sorry, I'm butchering this today, I should have rehearsed, uh, indefinitely more, individually more than marching to the beat of your own drum and no other. If that's your understanding of gods or whatever you'd like to call the hidden forces that arrange the known universe, how should you behave? Again, lacking a prescribed credo passed down from generation to generations, pagans began answering this question by casting off the tyranny of fixit fixity. The gods are precarious and ever-changing. Let us follow their example. We should sanctify each sharp transformation in our behaviors and beliefs, not as a collective madness, but as a sign of the wisdom of growth. 
the wisdom of growth, guys. Um, still, change alone does not is does not a belief system make. And pagans, despite differences galore, unite by providing similar answers to three similar questions: what to do about strangers, how to think about nature, and how to please the gods. Now, if you keep reading this article, it goes on a little further. I took a next snippet up here because I like to pick and choose what we're trying to talk about. Um, starting at the top, the answer, while wonderfully complex, right? <laughs> Hidden wisdom, right? While wonderfully complex may be distilled to the following principle. Nothing is true. Everything is permitted. And that's the essence of what we're talking about here. So how many of us, maybe I, I'm, I'm on an island here in my thoughts, but I, when I thought pagans, I don't think, oh, they're just they're just hedonistic. This is, it's, it, you know, they need to be worshiping Mother Earth or whatever it is and, you know, Stonehenge and all this other stuff. Like, that's not really what the belief system is. This is just postmodernism trying to steal the labor of label of paganism to try to hide the fact that it's just postmodernism. It, it's this idea that there's an infinite number of ways you can cross a field and they're all definitely right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh so however you want to live life is fine. It's totally up to you. Yeah. And so they're just I think the reason to then rip this ancient label out of the past is just to give it some validity as if that makes it um or true like a marketing almost like mm -hmm. it's, it's a term to kind of rally well, postmodernism is finally getting the the um evolved connotation that it deserves <laughs> like people are finally waking up to the fact that it's not a fantastic theory and ideology to live by so the fact that they would just steal an, another label and slap it on nothing new under the sun again right yeah uh, it's, and, and that's that's exactly the point kind of want to make it, when we talk about why and how people are drawn to this, think about the wonderfully complex. I mean, this this is like a hidden knowledge, guys. This is this is looking at me like, oh, wait, wait a minute. It, it's like the, the the new thing that I want to learn. It's kind of like what we were talking about with cults, with conspiracy theories. It's something that is is uh, unique. It's out there. It's iconoclastic. It, it goes against what you know and how you live and all this. Maybe it's true. Maybe there's something to this. And all of a sudden, now what what is real? Yes, sir. It just strikes me as you look at that screen, how many words really relate to our own fascination with ourselves, commentary, culture, civilization, paganism. And then you look at some of the words used in the article, and it really just emphasizes how fascinated man can become with himself, his own ability to use words, his ability to make comments about things, and lose complete focus on truth and on the existence of a greater power that you should teach because that's exactly what <laughs> this is that that is in summation exactly what the, the class is is today um it, it's a completely narcissistic view of life and it's, it's self-centered it's my happiness at the cost of all at, at the expense of all you know every, everyone else doesn't matter it's all me and that 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 is what this class is about, and and truly the dangers of that. Um, and we, we see these things. So, uh, going to the next slide. Um, so how many how many of these phrases have you all heard? And I, I've heard every single one of these. Again, you know, we established last week that I have weird friends and <laughs> crazy family and all this other stuff. Um, but have have y'all heard these? And you know, I'm, I I work in a corporate job. Uh, I was in the army before that. Wasn't much fun to join the army. I don't remember. <laughs> never, that wasn't the slogan. But uh, you know, in, in corporate life, if, if you've ever met like an HR rep, no offense to those HR reps, like, but it's like this is like this is it. It's all development. It's all it's all people for people culture. You know, um, what do y'all think? Y'all ever hear anything like this? At reading the um, the article that you had on the previous slide, that was the first thing I thought of was there's so much talk these days about you know your truth, my truth, speaking my truth. And, yeah. and it it's unsettling to me because I have the Bible, which is the truth. And it, it feels comforting to have something that's unchanging mm -hmm. to frame your worldview around versus just like loosey goosey, you know, whatever, whatever but, your truth is, your truth and mine's different. And it just, it sounds chaotic. It's like ham trying to hammer jello to a wall. Yeah. You know? It's like, it's not going to happen. And to like decorate a little girl's room, or even when you go shopping for little girl clothes, 
it's it's like so tricky as a mom because there's all this stuff celebrating girl power, you know, but it, it's there. It's like a slippery slope because some of the things say be yourself, which you want to raise girls to be themselves and not be trying to make themselves look like a perfection, you know, whatever this idea is. But then a lot of times it'll be something like be yourself, be wild, be free. And then I'm like, oh, no, ma'am. <laughs> it's all wrapped up and it's like you want to celebrate them you know this confidence and whatever that they might have but you just you see everywhere this and, and, and i'm i'm super happy you're going along that that like this i'm always worried because when i'm making this stuff i'm like okay this is where my mind goes but then you know, Sophia and I are talking, I'll show this, and she thinks, oh, you know, another way, and I'm like, well, that's where everybody else is going to go, I'm just crazy, you know, so I, that's exactly where I want to take the conversation, because we're all faced with that, and especially, I mean, I think there's there's an attack against girls, women, whatever it might be, and I think we can acknowledge that, and talk about how, you know, what we are doing as, as Christians, as parents, um, as, as ourselves, to combat this, and then also, are they all, we don't want to just be dogmatic for the sake of being dogmatic, and say, this is completely wrong. It's like, well, no, we need to establish why it is. And like kind of what you're saying, you know, because some of those messages are okay. Well, well, Julia came in this morning, we were getting ready, and she was wearing like athletic socks that came over like her boot, you know, and she is like, that's not a thing. And she's like, Yeah, it is, you know, and just like runs off. And it's like, does that matter? No, like I, maybe, maybe if it does, it does. Tell me. And then yeah. <laughs> like, no, it does, right? But, but like that means something like, hey, you be girl, like you, you be you. Like that's that's okay, you know. Here's what people think, maybe. But and then again, I'm getting in my opinion, right? But um, if it's something different, it's it's completely modest or or, or paint something that it goes toward the simple direction. That's something else. So, very good. Thank you. Awesome. So usually you start with your strongest point first, your strongest thing, and when God gave us the the Ten Commandments and He gave the old law. The very first thing was, you know, have no other gods before me. Like that was, I, I see that as very important. That's number one. And, you know, we put ourselves as a God. That's just what you're talking about. Mm. Well, in like half of these things here, you can, they're, they're not wrong, but you just have to pick out the word your. So be true, find joy, find truth, you know, follow passion. But we need to have all of those for God. And I mean, like, if we seek this, then you're going to find those things, but you got to take the door out of it. Yeah. No, I mean, I guess. Well, I was just going to say, when I'm reading all those, and I haven't heard it in a while, but used to, there was a big saying that, you know, religiously based is attend the church of your choice. Yeah. Very much so, yeah. It doesn't matter what kind, but just attend the church. Well, you know, we don't be careful. That that is just, it, is good. Rose view, so just attend something, right? Yeah, you know? and and I'll 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 throw one one on top of you. That, I mean, there's this agreement. What about you know if you if you're looking for a church family, you don't have to look anymore, or you found it. That's it's true, but it can also be kind of misconstrued along those lines, right? There is definite like asterisk footnotes of what we mean by that That's when i was reading those uh phrases i was thinking of the uh, praise god wants me to be happy and then he's totally suggesting true. we yes. need to do whatever you want that's it right. god made me this way yeah there we go is there a hand yes, sir. The, one that, the one that really gets me these days is be your authentic self yeah <laughs> what does that mean yeah you know, Lord, it's really used to try to justify simple practice that if i feel a certain way that my expression of that simple practice and being my authentic self in reality it's just a failure to recognize that there's always a battle between the flesh and the spirit and full truth god's truth is not chantable <laughs> that is complex and not in nuance to the point where like tim was saying you can't sum it up in a two or three word phrase. And so a lot of this, uh, these become overloaded, simple statements that have all this other meaning. The love is love 
right. is yeah. quite a loaded statement. Yeah. And so, unfortunately, we are quite bombarded with a lot of these, and we may not know or have the time to really figure out the depth of all these things. Some of them we hear frequently enough and understand the uh, propaganda that comes with it. Right. But we, we almost have to take a lot of these uh, expressions with a grain of salt and say, well, we're going to have to think about this more deeply and compare it back to what the Bible says. Right. I think to actively pushing against it also, at least in your own mind, like the whole fulfillment thing, that's why I put a little asterisk on there. Like in the, in the corporate world, this is this is hammering home, right? Like you need to be a company, man or woman. Like there's, there's you know, this is your fill in the name of the blank of the company, family. You know, there's a, there's a sense of loyalty that comes with this, your development and, and all those things are like, it's, it's not bad, it's, you know, develops professionally or in a trade or a career or whatever it might be. But at the same time, like that's not that's not our, our purpose, right? And I think for, for me at least on the, the careeristic type mentality, that's a that's a huge temptation. I mean, I, I just in, in this point in my life where I'm at, um, it, it's it's a constant, you know, you, you find yourself drifting to a certain way and making choices that one choice is not bad, one choice is not bad, one choice is not bad, but all of a sudden there's a there's a trajectory, you know, and that's that's the danger of, of a lot of this, at least, like I said, I really enjoyed putting this lesson together because it was like, okay, this hits home. Because I, I find myself saying stuff like this, you know, and it's like, well, and I find myself saying it in a way that is not right or isn't the way a Christian should be. Um, let's, let's contrast this um, with Matthew 16, 24. And I find too more and more brotherhood in, in from from Christians that I know and respect in, in classes and uh, everything. Not necessarily here, but just but just in in general. Uh, many times when we read or like statements like we're about to read, we don't let it. We don't let that sharpness sit. We then have to start giving the the, the notes of like, well, it, it doesn't mean that. X, Y, and Z, you can't do this. Instead of it almost meaning like, well, there's a danger with this. Remember this. So like keeping the sharpness of that on there. I um, mean, again, tell me if, if uh, I don't mean to overspeak or anything. If I am. Uh, let's read Matthew 6, verse 24 through 27. Uh, then Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, the Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father and with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Um, what, what do y'all think as far as how does how does this mentality compare to the messaging that, that we just read that we saw? Gonna and just like some like you are too, and it's so hard for me to listen myself second or ensure that I'm not putting myself above um, what's most important, God, and you know all those things, even my family. Absolutely. I mean, it's 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 excruciatingly painful. Like, because like you have this little, you know, like my boss asks, "Are you content?" I'm in a competitive sales role. Like, no. If, if I'm content, my kids starve. You know, not that I'm just being, <laughs> being. Not that's not true. That's not true. But what I'm saying is, I enjoy trying very very hard. Like that's that's a it's a hard work is a core belief. You know, and we're gonna get into Ecclesiastes because in in one section about ten ten verses we're gonna read and compare and contrast that but that's something that at the same time i'm called to be content and i'm called to remember that hey we're all going to die all this is going to be burned up like it doesn't matter and how, how in your mind how do you hold those two those two thoughts and how does a christian approach what they're doing i was going to say you know i was brought up watching both of my parents work very hard my grandparents working hard i feel like is a good thing but then you have to balance that and never, ever 
but make that more important. And for me, I find that very hard. Yeah. And I mean, Adam's very driven and I don't ever, ever, ever want to put self or work or anything else about God, my family, you know, that, but it's, it's a balancing hour. I mean, you really have to say, you know, no to certain things. We're not always called driven people. All the people that he called True. to do his will were driven and busy people. So the work ethic is godly. It's how it's applied. Is it applied towards the kingdom or is it applied towards part of the self? Sorry, I got really distracted with it. Um, very good. So um, were, were there any pieces yes. of advice, we'll call it, we'll label these messages, advice, whatever you want to call it, that you subscribe to? That you're like, okay, I, I, I go with that. So I'll start it off just because it's not like, oh, you know, me. Um, doesn't give me joy. I use it all the time. <laughs> all the time. Um, anybody ever heard? Let's let let's tell ladies in Japanese. Like, Maria Kondo. Yeah, Kondo. Kondo. Yeah. I love her show. It's great, right? Or, I go to my closet all the time yeah. today. No joy. Exactly. No joy. Now, now explain what we're talking about. So Maria Kondo has this thing. If you have an object, you haven't used it, it brings you no joy. Why are you keeping it in your life? So if it brings you no joy, you don't need it. And it's to help you declutter. If you declutter your space, you'll just clutter your life and sort of process. It's not right. a process. I, I was raised in an environment where we kept everything. <laughs> and exactly. not only that, we passed everything on to someone else. And it's like, hey, this random box of junk, you need to keep this. I don't want it anymore. <laughs> you need to keep this. It means a lot to our family. It's on you. Right. And then now I'm having all this sentimental stuff and it's just overwhelming. And it's like, so me and I, we, we've been pretty ruthless. Like, we'll get rid of it. It's like, listen, no, I'm going to have one thing to remember these people by. Not, they don't get to decide what's important to me, right? You, you kind of hopefully understand what I'm saying. Um, right, right. And so I, I need, the, I, I use it in that way, yeah. right? And, but if it's, again, used in, in another way that's like, hey, I think it's in the universe. This doesn't give me this, whatever, then that, that would be. I could very easily go in another direction. She also has a spiritual component too that that is weird it's, and it's weird. And so yeah. So anybody, anybody else? No big deal. No, no problem. It'll just be a rag on me day. You can't rag on me though. That's already dead. <laughs> go ahead. Um, I mean, like we were saying earlier, I told Julia especially she's a girl to be true to herself, but I I mean that in the way of like don't change who you are just because you, you know, wanted yeah. to be like popular girls or just things that we dealt with in school of like, you know, like just be you all the time and who you are is beautiful inside and out. Just be yourself. But I know like they were saying earlier, a lot of those things have a tie now, like like love is love shouldn't be a bad thing, but now everyone knows what that means. Right. And so you can't say that. So And I mean, it's, it's not said in vacuum either, like we're reinforcing. And so, yeah. I think too, like, I mean, if you have to have a job, you need to have a job that you like to go to. Mm -hmm. If you don't, then you get resentful of that job. You get resentful. I mean, I would think of the people you're having to do that job for. So, I mean, that piece of it is important. And you also want to, you want to go to a job that you were blessed with skills to do so that that way you're, you're good at it. It's in with your capabilities. Yeah. Your talents. But at, on the flip side, you have, as, a, as a grown up, you have to have a job. I love ballet so much. I want to be a ballet. That for me as a grown up did not really make sense for the, for the other things that were very important to me. So for a long time, that was my passion, but I didn't follow my passion. I changed my passion to be something that was more within the guidelines of how God would want me to live my life, if that makes sense. So I think, and, and also like as a leader of your household, as a man, you have to have a job. You might not have the job that you dreamed of as a little boy, but you have a job that provides well for your family. So you have to see the good in, in that and not let some of these things like play with your mind of like being unhappy like 
this isn't my passion. Like, you know, I'm not I'm, every day, all day, I'm doing my passion. Like sometimes kids bite me at school and it's not. <laughs> <laughs> You know, there are days where I feel like when I go to work and I, I'm working with these kids, like I, I give everything to them. And when I get home, I don't have a lot left. That does happen some days. It does not happen every day. And I think, you know, with everything, there are just days like that, where on that day, like I gave more energy to those little kids than I did to my little kids, but it's not every day. And so I make sure it stays in a balance and so you can't beat yourself up sometimes because maybe on that day work just exhausted you if it's every day you need to do something like that. but it is going to happen sometimes. there's nothing wrong with, with finding personal fulfillment in your career it's quite a blessing when you do find fulfillment in your career the, the problem what you're describing brian is is the business trying to take over the role of the family and so, so many people, especially in our culture, have no family structure left anymore. And then they reject um, the church, which is God's uh, family, which is supposed to supplement the physical family. Um, and so now they're trying to find it in the business relationship, which doesn't quite work for a lot of reasons. Um, so yeah, what Heather was saying, it, it's it's lovely when we can find fulfillment in what we do, but also, one mantra I keep repeating to Lucy is, we have to do a lot of things we don't like to do. Yeah. <laughs> we just do. And that's and good. Exactly. Get over it. <laughs> Go. Oh, I like it a bit. No, <laughs> <laughs> no um, so there's, I don't know if y'all seen them, but um, Dennis Prager, he has little five-minute videos and snippets. They're pretty good. But one of them is Mike Rowe, dirty jobs guy, right? And he's talking about... Uh, all these people that have come out and said, you know, follow your passion. And, he's, and he gives these little examples of how people go on American Isle or whatever. And people, they've been told, follow your passion, follow your passion. And they have zero skill. And, they, you know, yeah. there. and they've been told their whole life that they're the best thing since, you know, peanut butter jelly. And they get crushed because they can't do anything. They can't sing or do anything. And so then he contrasts that with somebody who followed opportunity and was a guy that cleaned out the porta potties and became a multimillionaire. And so it's like, he says, follow opportunity, but take your passion with you. He's like, you know, that will, that will guide you. And you know what? We have a great opportunity right here. This is our opportunity. And so we need to follow this opportunity. Well, and like kind of to Heather's point, you know, when you're young, you always want to be, you know, when you grow up a, a profession that has a name like a doctor lawyer policeman you know whatever yeah, no one wants to be in sales you know well <laughs> you know, the bosses he said nobody nobody when they're young says i'm going to be in compliance for a pharmaceutical company yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know through different choices that you make sometimes that's where you end up and you know is what i do every day necessarily you know my passion no but you know to his point i find passion in what i'm doing I'm able to use skills that I have to complete work that's important. And so I find fulfillment in that. But, um, you know, to your point about the, the corporate world kind of like pushing you in a, in a career driven, you know, work is the most important thing kind of direction. You have to kind of temper that like, yeah, I may be really good and I can get to this, you know, prestigious position over here, but then I'm going to be working 90 hours a week. Right. What you yeah. know, literally and, game. And all of these things, these are all lies. These are absolutely lies. And it's, it's, it's propagated more so now than ever, you know, looking for that perfect thing that is alive within us. And people are saying it around us all the time. And so these are lies that Satan is telling us always. I was just thinking about all these things, you know, like he's saying that they're lies and, and where they really need to be directed is where is our truth? Where's our joy? Where's our passion? And it made me think of Hebrews 12. Um, where we're talking about running our, our race with endurance, and but we're looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. And, you know, that was his joy, was fulfilling God's mission, even though it was going to cost him. Right. Oh, well, that's all I need to find. I'm out. Good on that one. Let me, so, that's a perfect segue.
Okay. <laughs> know yourself. Um, I join organization. That's right. Yeah, I do not. Um, so along these lines, this one came up yesterday. It was the Wall Street Journal. Um, when will I retire? How about never? Okay. Now look look at look at the what are the care about in this article? Okay. Um, for many people, the idea of stopping work is a non-starter and an inevitable path to boredom, ill health, and a life devoid of meaning, right? We'll start with the top, right? You have worked in your profession for decades, perhaps even all your life. This is part of you, perhaps too big a part. One day you turn you turn that part of your life off. Okay, income loss aside, what are you gonna do now? Get caught up on home projects. Okay, after a couple of weeks, a couple of months, those items are taken care of. Play some golf, sure. But after a couple of months, that'll get old. Travel the world, great, if that's your thing, but it too will get old. So what do you do with all your free time? Just like muscles that atrophy, if you don't use them, certainly with money and cognitive abilities, you need to have engaging, stimulating activities planned. Otherwise, you will slowly wither and die with no purpose in life, no value to others. Uh, my wife, and what, what this was, they're quoting a guy that they're interviewing, sorry. Uh, my wife retired some years ago. She now believes it was one of the worst decisions of her life. Getting back into the workforce will be difficult and impossible. She has been out for a while, and companies do not want to hire older folks. Uh, volunteering is not her thing. Why work and not get paid? She is at a loss for what to do with her free time. What do we think about this? Christian, Christians don't have free time. There's always something you can be doing in the kingdom. And even if you are bedridden, you can still be praying for people and encouraging people. And so this just sounds like people trying to keep Social Security afloat by keeping people on the Like, you know, this is our proof. You're, you're, uh, Allie and I talked about this in our girls' class. You're, who you are as a person is not based in your career and your abilities. That's not what God is looking at. Because if, you know, if you've based your entire personality on your ability, to, to kick a ball and you blow your knee out, what happens to your life and your personality? This this is not what God looks at. I always I I am always impressed by men who serve as elders and still work full time. I'm wondering how they have time for anything else. That's two full time jobs. Well, I, I mean I, I look at this and it just blows my mind. Uh, I think there's some truth to this. Like we don't we don't want to just retire and then just quit. You know, yeah, you are gonna atrophy, your brain's gonna turn into pudding and you know, so so regardless of whether you work outside the home, whether you have a job in corporate America or whatever you're doing with your time on this earth, we need to be doing things, I think is kind of the point. And I mean, right. we're told to in here. So can anybody show me the verse where it talks about retirement? <laughs> like I can't find it. it. Talks about being like it well advanced in age and living with children and, and that along those lines. But the, the idea of retirement is like what a Western <laughs> cultural ideology, right? I mean, you want to talk to the guys in the Philippines or Zimbabwe that we support, there's no retirement, there's no there's no government assistance, like your your family's is your assistance, and you work till you die. Like is, is really what it comes down to. And I mean. The idea that in, in our culture of, okay, well, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit 55, 60, 65, whatever it is, and then all of a sudden, you know, I'm going to get my gold watch, and I'm just going to, then I have my life of leisure. You know, like that's that, that's a facade. It's not real. That's not, and, it, and it's not real because it, it's focused around you. You know, this is not saying you can't go on vacation, you can't do these things, but like that being when you're finally going to reap the fruits of your labor, that's not a biblical concept, I don't think. But correct me if I'm wrong, please. But well, there's, the, there's the anti. There's the anti of that. That's the guy that built the big barns that said, "Hey, I got it all covered. I'm good to go. I, I'm able to retire and not worry about any more expenses the rest of my life. I got it covered." That that is the person that God called a fool, and his soul would be required of him that very night. And so it's like it it does speak to the opposite, and that's very dangerous. And so, um, well. Stacy has a has a, a coworker who actually is a Christian. They and they met. They actually like worships at another church here in Fort Worth. It's fantastic. But they're coworkers, and she said she's never going to quit working. And I'm like, you know what? You're exactly right. Until until your body falls apart and your brain turns to goo, fine. You stay out there and you work as long as you can because it's it's about working. And and honestly, it, it provides us a great opportunity to be in contact with other people to talk about God. 
how many people do you come in contact with if you sit at home retired? Right. And that's kind of John's point of like, you know, we have a structure here with the church, so you have to work. A lot of people don't have that, or relatively so. And so therefore they just they go into isolation almost and it just they atrophy and die. You know, you point. Well, so, no, that point about retirement made me think about what we just read in Matthew 16 that uh, Jesus said, Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Then he says in verse 27, For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. You know, the true peace that we have isn't something that's assured to us in this life. Some really good points were made earlier about Jesus and his attitude about his life. Uh, well, God, but there is a reward. It's just not a reward that we're looking to when we're 65 years old and can sit back and take Social Security benefits. It's a reward that God gives us throughout the whole eternity. Kind of like the Jews being my looking to make Jesus the, the king on earth, right? The, you're, you're taking the carnal, or you're, you're mistaking carnal for, for the spiritual. Here. You know, you're completely having that. You know, this is where it is, and it's not. I totally agree. Um, let me count. Can I look, say something really? Yes, quick? please. I see that's a little different about his wife retiring. I see him more like she's stuck with her husband. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> and, She's stuck with her husband, and they're now they're both home together, and they're two different people than when they were home together when they were younger. And I think she's just using I'm going to die, not physically, just I'm going to kill him. <laughs> but it's not necessarily, I think she's using work as a cover for this perfect facade. Problem, right? You know, couples, kids, just a, I mean, just busy, exhausted all the time for 20 years, whatever it might be. And then, and then finally, you're in Knesters and you're retired. You're looking across the table at 10 a.m. on a Tuesday. COVID, the couple had to be both together all the time. And then they decided they didn't like each other. <laughs> And so that's how we got our house because she had to sell the house because he didn't want it. And so I, I think COVID, like what would she think? COVID was this mm -hmm. for so many people. It kind of was like a forced retirement situation and people realized they hadn't been putting the work into their relationships and families like they should have been. Sorry, this is all, all good conversation. I'd rather have conversations and make sure we hit every single thing. Uh, let's talk about this. So along this, this point right here, what are safeguards that you have personally used or should have or will, whatever tense you want to use it, uh, to ensure you're not tempted to make your happiness central part of your life? Understanding that happy is a feeling, joy is a skill, because joy is a fruit of the spirit. Joy can be developed. You can find joy in horrible, horrific, you know, history-making circumstances, and you can still be joyful because of that uh, heavenly reward. But happy is as fleeting as hunger. They have come and go. But he brought up Ms. Prager a minute ago, you know, who he says that happy people make the world better, you know, unhappy people make the world worse. The idea being you have a moral obligation to act happy. But I think a little um, better way to phrase that would be to act joyful because, you know, to Joanna's point, happiness is um, fleeting, but joy is something we can always display. And I think that's what we're called to do as Christians, whether we're working in the home and doing laundry that we don't want to do, or we're outside the home and, and, you know, we're having a frustrating day at work. Um, you know, people need to see in whatever we're doing, whatever the circumstances are throwing at us, we still have a joy that surpasses whatever experience I'm having at this moment. Absolutely. And I mean, uh, one, I, I see, I mean, happy people, obviously, like, I mean, we should be happy, but th there's also an, an element sometimes with, with some people, maybe, and I try not to follow this and do this, but of, of fakeness. Yeah. Sometimes where it's like, 
you know the person is struggling and and it's just oh, I'm great I'm great I'm like that. you know it's just like I can't help you it's, yeah yeah exactly and I mean I I've been in just these horrific situations and like in the army specifically and it, it there is a sense of of joy with you know this like a brotherhood around you you know that it's like this is pretty terrible, isn't it? Like, yeah, it is, you know. And you laugh and joke about it. So, I mean, there, there's that sense of joy that's there without, without almost without happiness, you know. And, and so, we can be going through terrible, terrible things and still be joyful. Well, that's, you know, I watched a widow, a young widow, at her husband's funeral, clearly upset and crying, and she was still able to greet the, the visitors to her husband's funeral with a smile through the tears. That's not a woman who's happy, but she was still full of joy because she had that hope for where he had gone. And, and one, that is viewing life through the prism of Christ, right? And not through the prism of just secular carnal pleasure. So um, it, like we said, it's a choice. It's like you, you can have everything in the world taken from you, but you still have, if, if everything's gone, you still have that choice yes or no, that you can choose joyfulness and to have that. And, and I don't know, Prager, I, I feel like he gets a little bit wrong because he says you can choose happiness. He talked about that. But I think better off, you can choose this joyfulness. Now, two people that did that in Acts with Paul and Silas, they're in the middle of that prison in, in Philippi, and they're singing. And, and they're not like just at the little prison. They're like at the innermost prison, right? They're the ones that got tossed in the dark dungeon. And they're singing and it led to the jailer being converted later on because he heard that he's like, what in the world? What is wrong with How these do you in a state loud enough How to dare you sing in this terrible place? But they did it anyway. One, one thing I, I would, in, in thinking about this, I would caution you on, you know, again, tell me what, what you think about this as far as safeguards. Um, counselors, therapists, all these, you know, anyone that, that is their profession is influencing your mind. Um, be very... I won't say leery, but just just be cautious. So, not in any way saying that, that seeking treatment or anything like that is, is wrong. It, it's I, I firmly believe that it's a, it's a good thing. It is a medical treatment. But with that said, you know, someone saying, "Oh, well, you know, if you and your spouse are getting, you know, not not getting along, well, are you sure that that's a good relationship to be in?" That's a that's a very of the world, common sense type question and line of reasoning, but it's completely against God. So just be very alert for that. Same thing with, with mentors, you know, you, you being a mentee, whether it's professionally or whatever it is. If they're not Christians or they're Christians that maybe don't have the right mindset a lot of times, be very, very leery of anyone that you're asking outside of the Bible to influence your, how you view the world. Well, just a couple of practical things that help me when it comes to this topic is making sure that you take time, you devote time in the morning, the evening, both. Right, the point to dwell on God's word, pray to God, and also budgeting a certain amount of time to give, not just here with, with the work of the local church, but just to give to people in need or to provide hospitality. Be thoughtful about that, and that promotes an attitude of self Right, it's important to realize the pressure that those statements put on kids. Because right now, like sadness and depression in young kids is at the biggest height of all time. And I think it's because of those statements. Find your happiness, find your passion, be yeah, doing it wrong. What am I doing do wrong? That by themselves. They need God's word. They need that truth. So as parents, we have to safeguard our kids against that because there's so much pressure they get of they're supposed to find all this stuff. Well, how? How did they do that? And right. then I think that's what leads to so many issues with little kids right now. I just think a lot of it is that you're, they're finding their happiness in the wrong things or their joy in the wrong things, whether it's sports or your career or just materialistic things. Um, and the motives for those can be okay. They can be good and yes. wholesome, but, if that's but misdirected. Thing, it makes me think of Lot and like losing everything. Um, his joy wasn't in all the Anytime throughout the years when I start feeling down or whatever, I'm so focused on myself. And so I, we started doing something where, okay, if I start 
feeling weird about myself, I'm going to find something to do for somebody else. And usually it's some kind of manual labor because I'm not really skilled otherwise. <laughs> but, you know, it's not like I'm like mowing yards, but just the fact that, you know, the joy that I get yeah. from it is doing something that, that, you know, maybe somebody's sick or they're taking care of somebody sick or something. You go mow their yard. I mean, that, you know, what you help them and, and, and it just, it's not focusing on yourself, what Kyle was saying. Right. Where's the kind of minor duty and responsibility? Yeah. Cool. Thank you all so much for the conversation. Really good. Really appreciate it. We'll, I can, like, Thank you. <laughs>